Please be seated. Good evening to you. Acts chapter 1 this evening, Sunday night through the Bible, Genesis to Revelation. And uh, while we're finding our place there, just a reminder that next Sunday night we'll be having our uh, uh, water baptism and uh, heading into spring, and so uh, regular service time, six o'clock. But we'll all be meeting, the kids, everybody, all meeting out in the courtyard and water baptism. We'll enjoy the Lord's Supper as well, and uh, then a little bit of refreshment afterwards. And if you've never been water baptized, it's important to realize that that's a command. There are reasons for it. Uh, All you need to do in order to be uh, ready for water baptism and to be pre- qualified for it, so to speak, is to be born again by the Holy Spirit. And what it represents and why it's important and what you're doing on that night, I'll explain all of that prior to the water baptism. It's just if you haven't been water baptized, you come on out and uh, uh, we'll take it uh, from there. Uh, Acts chapter 1, picking things up in uh, verse 1. The former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach until the day that he was taken up after he through the Holy Spirit had given commandments uh, to the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom also he presented himself alive after his sufferings by many infallible proofs being seen by them during 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of uh, God. I don't know about you, I uh, use a, I have a New King James Schofield Bible, and so the title of the book is, uh, they entitle it, The Acts of the Apostles. And so um, this book definitely has that as a secondary uh, meaning and explanation for it, but it is supremely a book of the Acts of the Holy Spirit. Uh, uh, The Acts of the Apostles, apart from the Holy Spirit, would be a very different book of Acts than the one that we read. The Holy Spirit is the one who makes the difference in all of this. What it provides us with, we're told uh, early here, it provides us with a needed insight into the person and the ministry of the Holy Spirit, probably the most overlooked member uh, of the Godhead, and it gives us instruction concerning uh, what the body of Christ, what the church will look like under the direction of the Holy Spirit. So we've been through the Gospels, and Jesus has taught uh, us as his children uh, a lot of things in the Gospels. And then, but now how does that translate into Uh, this season known as the church age following his ascension into heaven. How do these things translate into uh, the dynamic that is the body of Christ? What is a local church service supposed to to, uh, look like? And how do we handle persecution and prayer meetings and all of these things that are included within this this book? The book of... of, um, Uh, Acts also provides us with the historical uh, settings for all of the Apostle Paul's letters, except for 1st and 2nd Timothy uh, and Titus. And so it helps us to see, uh, to understand, uh, not only to translate the teaching of the Gospels into the church age, but it also helps us to understand the context of all of the epistles that, Paul's epistles that constitute so much of uh, the New Testament. When the author of the the book of Acts here, the human author, author, he identifies himself as the one who wrote a former account to a man by the name of Theophilus. And uh, and the former account that he wrote, we know uh, from the similarity of the introduction, we know it to be the gospel according to Luke, and so there's internal evidence that you can get into and all, but sufficient to say that it's there. And uh, Dr. Luke is the uh, human uh, instrument that God used to write both the gospel according uh, to Luke and then also the book of Acts. He's the only Gentile author in the New Testament, and I think it's something like 28% between the two books of the New Testament is uh, written by, uh, by him. And, 
And so he, uh, uh, he is known, the Apostle Paul knew Luke very, very well, uh, referred to him as the uh, beloved physician. It, it, Theophilus, it isn't uh, unlikely that Theophilus, who he writes this letter to, that Theophilus was, um, uh, owned him at one time. Now, slavery in the ancient world and slavery in the modern world were uh, almost always two entirely different things. Um, oftentimes a person would be, as would be the case of a physician, is that you would see aptitude within a young person, for instance, for the area of medicine, and then a family would then pay for that, uh, that person's education, and though a slave, they would become the family physician. It, it isn't at all unlikely that uh, Theophilus becomes a Christian somewhere along the line and, and, and becomes into contact with the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul was having uh, at times significant physical problems on his three missionary journeys and that Theophilus then kind of uh, released his uh, family physician to then travel with the Apostle Paul and take care of him on these missionary uh, journeys as a kind of repayment, so to speak, for uh, this freedom that was given to him by Theophilus. Uh, the idea is that he then, to show his appreciation, wrote to him uh, the gospel according to Luke. And uh, based upon firsthand accounts and firsthand witnesses to everything that happened, he said, what's the best way that I can uh, bless my master? Theophilus means a lover of God. So he, he uh, probably very much was a Christian or what would the gospel mean to him in, in the deepest way? And so this is what uh, Luke did and he did it inspired uh, by the Holy Spirit. And so this, uh, this writing and the background here to, uh, to the book of, uh, of Acts. Uh, the purpose of the Luke account and, and uh, in verse one, that former account, which is the gospel according to Luke, uh, Luke tells us uh, that that gospel was in order to provide an account of all that Jesus began to do and to teach. You might remember that it concluded, the gospel of, according to Luke, concludes with Jesus' ascension uh, into uh, heaven. And so Jesus had given commandments to the apostles that he had chosen uh, following his resurrection in that 40 days between his resurrection from the dead and his ascension uh, into heaven and, uh, and uh, other activities that were involved in that 40 days, you might wonder, well, what did he do for the 40 days? I mean, there's not a lot written about what he did for the 40 days. We, uh, we know from uh, John's Gospels we studied last week that one event was the fact that he met the disciples up by the Sea of Galilee and he restored Peter uh, publicly, restored him back into his apostolic uh, ministry. Uh, but here uh, Luke tells us that the 40 days were about Jesus, his appearances, uh, providing evidence for his resurrection. Uh, he then appeared to the disciples and others uh, during that time. His appearance provided many, many infallible proofs, Luke says, for Jesus' resurrection. And Jesus spoke things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And so again, there's this transition that's occurring. Jesus is no longer going to be around now. He's going to ascend into heaven. And so all of this is going to shift over to the Holy Spirit. And that 40 days was spent in preparing them uh, for exactly that and that next uh, chapter in God's uh, work um, in the world and how to represent the kingdom of God in, in the context of the darkness of this, uh, this world. And so uh, this is what uh, those 40 days were about. Now, one of the things that... Um, Luke does, and I, always, uh, I, I like to listen to audio books, and, um, and, 
and so when, with, with uh, my particular phone, when I hit a pause on that, and uh, on the audio book that I'm listening to, when I come back to it and turn it on, it kind of goes about 10 seconds back, and then it helps me to remember where I was and to kind of regroup. It provides me with a little bit of an overlap. Luke does the same thing in between the gospel according to Luke and the book of Acts because the overlap is the ascension of Jesus. He closed the book of Luke, he opens, uh, very nearly opens the book of Acts, talking about this ascension, gets us all on the same page so we can then move forward understanding uh, the place that all of it uh, plays. Jesus then, we're told in verse four, being assembled together with uh, the disciples, he commanded them not to depart from the city of Jerusalem, but to wait and to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. Uh, For John, that is John the Baptist, truly baptized with water, Jesus said, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. In fact, exactly 10 days from the day of Jesus' ascension, Pentecost 50, and uh, day of Pentecost uh, occurring 50 days after Jesus' resurrection, his ascension at 40 days, and a a 10-day waiting for this baptism uh, with the Holy Spirit. And therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, it's not for you to know the times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. And so Jesus, in terms of the background of what leads us up to this, he uh, gave the uh, disciples, we know from, another, from one of the gospels, he gave the disciples a great commission uh, on, on a mountain in the Galilee region. Then Jesus and the disciples make their way back down into the city of, of Jerusalem. They're assembled somewhere, Jesus is at this point, with his disciples in the city of Jerusalem. Again, 40 days since his resurrection, and, and, uh, and this is the day of his uh, ascension. And so this is his last meeting with the, with the disciples, and you think about that. Um, uh, one, of the, one of the great things, for instance, about, um, I, prob- I've heard it, I was never in the military, but I've heard a bit about it in terms of military, the intensity of that kind of an experience and how it bonds a group of people together in a unique way for the rest of their uh, life. I think in a, in a far less intense kind of way, one of the great things about taking a trip to Israel with a group of Christians is that you now have this certain thing in common with, with, uh, with one another and, uh, and it unites you in a beautiful way really for the rest of, uh, of your lives. And so you think about, think about the intensity, the beauty, I mean indescribable amazingness, if that's a word, of these men who had been three and a half years with Jesus during his uh, public ministry. And all of that, that season of that unique history now is coming to an end with his, his ascension in terms of him physically being with them. And, and they always, you can buy books on the last words of whoever. And uh, typically when somebody's going to die or somebody's going to leave, they're going to be gone for a long time, as is the case uh, with Jesus before he returns again. You typically, when you leave loved ones, whatever your parting words are, are carefully chosen. They are uh, the most important thing that you think that you can say to them uh, with that, that season of separation that is coming now, and so you wonder what in the world is Jesus going to uh, speak to them uh, now that he's about to leave them. And Jesus commanded the disciples not to to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which is the baptism with the Holy Spirit. So he says, do not leave Jerusalem. I want you to wait for this experience with the Holy Spirit. And that word wait really gets my attention because that would be the last thing. If you ask me to guess at what Jesus would say to these people, these uh, 11, um, 
disciples after three and a half years of ministry, of hearing all of his teachings, seeing all of his miracles, the last thing I would have thought he would say to them is wait. Uh, my, what I would think he would say to them is, if you're not ready after three and a half years of what you've seen and what you've been in the middle of, you're never going to be ready. Get some tracks together and start reaching uh, Jerusalem and the uttermost parts of the world with the gospel. That's what I expect. But that would be the Acts of Damien and Kyle. And that's not the name of the book. And so Jesus has something entirely different uh, in mind. He tells them to wait. So whatever Jesus is telling them that they're to wait for, which is the baptism of the Holy Spirit, clearly in Jesus' mind, uh, and that's the only mind that matters, nothing can replace the baptism of the Holy Spirit. For this season of separation between the church and Jesus in terms of his physical presence. No amount of experience, they had all kinds of experience. Uh, No amount of teaching or talent or training or determination can replace the baptism of the Holy Spirit uh, or they would have been ready for ministry uh, without it. And so Jesus says, don't talk for me, uh, don't preach for me, don't do anything for me until you've been baptized with the Holy Spirit. And so whatever this baptism with the Holy Spirit is, it is irreplaceable to Jesus. It is invaluable in the mind of Jesus, not concerning just the church as a whole, but concerning each and every one of our our lives uh, individually. He describes this baptism with the Holy Spirit in verse 4 as uh, the promise uh, of the Father and uh, and, uh, to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. It is, to, it is something that the Father promised, something that, is, that the Father spoke and promised to, uh, to God's people when the day of fulfillment would, would come. He describes this experience as being baptized with the Holy Spirit. It is important for us to understand when I, when I got going with the Lord, I had spent a portion of, of my youth in a church that was... Um, Uh, they weren't comfortable with the person of the Holy Spirit. And they weren't comfortable. I I loved them dearly. I learned more than I could ever say in in that that church. But they weren't comfortable with the person and the work of the Holy Spirit. And they didn't believe that an awful lot of gifts of the Holy Spirit uh, were for uh, today. And so uh, when I became a Christian, And I started attending a Calvary Chapel, and the pastor up in front starts talking about this baptism with the Holy Spirit and talking about spiritual gifts as if they're for today, including the gift of tongues. It was hard for me to stay in my seat. I I thought for a moment, I'm brand new to everything, I thought for a moment, I'm, I'm not in a good place here. But I had been going to the church long enough that the, the pastor would teach, uh, read the Word of God, he would explain what it says, you could look down and see it, and I grew to trust him. So I had these two kind of views related to the Holy Spirit and concerning spiritual gifts uh, that were in, going on in my life, and I thought, well, I'm going to find what are the finest resources in print that I can find that are uh, pro uh, these things as a part of the Christian life and then hostile toward these things. And I found hostile toward these things in, in uh, one particular Bible teacher who remains influential uh, even to this day. But I read through all of them, trying to be uh, fair-minded ab- about all of it, and, uh, and then I come to realize that when uh, the baptism with the Holy Spirit and the promise of the baptism with the Holy Spirit, it is not something that Pentecostals came up with. It's the Father's idea. It's the Father's promise. 
And so often we can hear talking to somebody talks about, well, have you been baptized with the Holy Spirit or the baptism of the Holy Spirit? And we think, oh, that's just a Pentecostal thing. Not at all. It's something that Jesus spoke about and he described it as a promise uh, of uh, the Father. It's his idea. And he had spoken of it in the Old Testament, Joel chapter 2, verse 28. And it shall come to pass afterwards that I will pour out my spirit uh, upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams and your among young men shall see visions. And also on my men servants and on my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit uh, in those days. Jesus spoke. Uh, repeatedly of the baptism with the Holy Spirit. In John uh, chapter 16 here, John the Baptist spoke of it in terms of the life of ministry, uh, uh, ministry of Jesus. Mark chapter one, there comes one after me who is mightier than I, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to stoop down and loose. I indeed baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. And so here Jesus is reminding the apostles or the disciples uh, concerning uh, John the Baptist's uh, uh, promise uh, of the baptism with the Holy Spirit and then telling them that this is going to uh, very soon come to pass in their lives. Now, Jesus is talking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. He's saying like um, just the most important thing on his heart and his mind at the moment. And then um, somebody interrupts him. In verse 6, you talk about a dollar waiting on a dime. Uh, Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him and saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? So he's talked to them about the baptism with the Holy Spirit, but they want to know when he's going to set up his kingdom. Uh, The kingdom age that is promised all the way through the Uh, the Old Testament. That's what they want to talk about. We don't want to talk about the baptism with the Holy Spirit. When are you going to set up your physical kingdom, the kingdom of God, what we know is the millennial kingdom, the thousand-year reign of Christ? When are you going to establish that? That's what excites us uh, us, uh, the most. That's what we want uh, to talk about. And of course, Jesus knew that there would be at least a 2,000-year and counting gap between his ascension and his second coming to establish that kingdom and that the more immediate need for them was to understand, for Christians to understand how to navigate life in this world uh, and uh, by the power of the Holy Spirit. And so, uh, this comforts me. I've asked so many questions. <laughs> it's just like you ask it and then your face turns all red and you say, I'm never going to open my mouth again for the rest of my life. I, I, I will say that I uh, never uh, uh, did anything quite like interrupting Jesus while he's talking. But that might just be because I wasn't there. And so Jesus said to them, it's not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put uh, in his own authority. And so he redirects the class, so to speak, uh, back to what he's talking about. I'm not talking about uh, the kingdom right now in terms of the physical kingdom or the uh, thousand-year reign. You just leave the restoration of the kingdom to God the Father, and you give your attention here to the baptism with the Holy Spirit. And then Jesus returns to the subject of the baptism of the Holy Spirit in verse 8, and he does so in earnest. He said, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends uh, of the earth. And so he begins now his description of this baptism with the Holy Spirit. You notice, and, and you can just about circle every word in the verse in terms of its importance, but I want you to notice, first of all, that the baptism of the Holy Spirit involves the Holy Spirit coming upon a Christian. And it's worth circling that word upon uh, in, uh, in that verse. 
In the New Testament, there are three uh, Greek prepositions that are used to describe the relationship uh, of the Holy Spirit to the Christian. There is the word para, which means uh, alongside. The Holy Spirit is known as the parakletos, one who comes alongside us to help. Every one of us has, as a Christian has the Holy Spirit alongside us. He is omnipresent, he is alongside us. The second Greek preposition is the Greek word en. It's the equivalent of our word in. And that second relationship of a Christian to the Holy Spirit is that he is in us. That is the spiritual birth, being born again. Nobody can be a Christian without having the Holy Spirit come into our lives. That spiritual birth is what uh, makes us uh, Christians, and, uh, and Jesus uh, teaching that, and all of the epistles teaching it uh, as well. So Jesus talks to these disciples, and the Holy Spirit is already para with them. The Holy Spirit is already en, or uh, in them. That's already happened, those two relationships. You might remember uh, two weeks ago when we were looking in John uh, chapter 20, and Jesus comes to the disciples on the uh, evening of uh, his resurrection, and he breathes upon uh, the disciples, and he says, receive ye the Holy Spirit. And they receive the Holy Spirit, the inexperience of the Holy Spirit uh, at that uh, moment. But here Jesus speaks to the same group of men about something additional and upon experience of, of the Holy Spirit uh, upon their lives and upon our lives. And so the epi, which is upon, epi being the, uh, the, the Greek word for it, that is the baptism with the Holy Spirit. Is the Holy Spirit not only with me, the Holy Spirit not only in me, but the Holy Spirit now upon me. And that's what Jesus wants for each of our lives as Christians. He recognizes that, that we need it. You notice that this baptism of the Holy Spirit as well is for the provision of power in our lives, power from the Holy Spirit. He said, you shall receive power. The word for power there is dunamis, means dynamic power. Uh, and we get our English word from uh, the word that's used here, the Greek word, we get dynamo, we get dynamic, we get uh, dynamite from, from that word. And so it's talking about this kind of a dynamic empowerment of the Holy Spirit. You notice that the empowering, this provision of power is for a purpose. And Jesus tells us it's power to be witnesses to Jesus Christ. It's not power to lengthen legs, necessarily. That's a miracle, that's a work of the Holy Spirit, a gift of the Holy Spirit, but that's not what he's talking about here. It is the power to be witnesses uh, to Jesus, and you shall be witnesses to me, he said. The power to live a life that looks like Jesus. You notice that it is more than the, po than the power to witness. It is more than him giving me the power to go out and to witness the gospel to the world. This is something more than that. It is the power to be a witness in our lives, to properly reflect Jesus uh, in, through our lives in the world uh, that, that we live in. And witnessing is not something that, uh, just something that I do, but it's to be something that I am. And the baptism with the Holy Spirit allows that to happen. So the entirety of my life is witnessing, speaking uh, of Christ, the supernatural. And the Christian life is intended to be supernatural. And this is the super, supernatural dynamic that comes uh, to our lives. The power to uh, be a witness to Jesus, to serve him, to obey his commandments, to, to live a different kind of life in this world, and, and to do so even to the point uh, of death if, if necessary. 
Now, the terminology here is interesting uh, to me, and I think it's informative. When Jesus describes this experience, this upon experience, he describes it as the baptism with the Holy uh, Spirit. And he, he wants to communicate something uh, through that language that he's using there. And uh, I, we're going to have a water baptism next uh, Sunday night. And when I put someone down uh, under the water, and I'm just led by the Lord, how long? that We've got to drive home that point that they are now a new creation and the old man is dead. So I always tell them, take a deep breath. I'm just kidding. We get you right back up out of the water. Um, I used to do that once in a while when we had baptisms out at Faith Home, and I would take somebody that I knew personally and wouldn't take it personal, and I knew they had a pretty rough background, and then they got saved, and I'd hold them under for a while, and, uh, but it terrified the kids. And there they were waiting to, in line to be baptized, and they're, they're backing into their mom and dad, you know, what's he going to do to me? So uh, I've learned a few things over the years, not many, but that's, uh, that's one of them. The other one is when somebody, a, a woman, a husband and wife have given birth to a baby, and you visit them in the hospital, what I used to say once in a while, when they'd be holding the baby, I would say, isn't evolution wonderful? And uh, just the impossibility of the miracle. But not everybody knew I was joking, so um, I had to let that go. I basically have had to let go of everything that I think is terrific about my life. And, uh, my sense of humor in terms of, of, of talking with people. But when you baptize someone in water, you pull them up, they've got friends and family members waiting there to hug them. When you baptize someone who has been baptized in water, what do you get on you? You get water on you. Uh, transfers off of them uh, and, and then uh, to you. And when you've been baptized in the Holy Spirit, uh, then now uh, going forward, when people come into contact with you, they'll be coming into contact with uh, the Holy Spirit. And so the baptism of the Holy Spirit is given so that for the rest of my life, in order that when people now come into contact with me, they no longer come into contact with the old Damien Kyle, but they now come into contact with the, the work of the Holy Spirit and the person of the Holy Spirit in my life. I don't want anybody to ever come into contact with the old Damien Kyle ever again. So this is a tremendous, uh, a, a tremendous uh, blessing and God provides this to us so that people will come into contact with him when they come into contact with us. You notice that it is the power uh, to be a witness, Jesus said, uh, everywhere we go. Uh, in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. Now, remember, uh, these guys are going to get sent in the Great Commission to the four corners of the world, so to speak. And God's people have been sent through church history to the four corners of the world. In other words, this power to live as a witness to Jesus Christ is available to us and it's effectual, not just in Jerusalem or not just in a country that has a Judeo-Christian heritage, but in any environment that God might send us to, including not only on the other side of the world, but in whatever apartment complex he locates us in or whatever school he puts us uh, in, in life, any environment. Here is the power to be a witness to Christ in that environment. Uh, the desire to be strong, to be like Christ in that environment, and now the power and the ability to be what I want to be in, in, that, uh, in that environment. And so every part of the world and every part of our life, everywhere we go in life has its own challenge in terms of, of being a witness to Christ there, but the Holy Spirit will empower me for it. And sometimes the hardest uh, places to be a witness for Christ uh, is, uh, to live as a witness for him is in Jerusalem, home, and on the other side of the world where no one knows you. 
And here's the power to be that everywhere, at both of those extremes, and then everywhere uh, in uh, between. Sometimes somebody can think, I don't know that I need uh, this baptism with the Holy Spirit. I'm not a missionary. Uh, I'm just raising children. <laughs> I'm just married. Well, if you're married to a man, you need to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And if you're married to a woman, you need to be baptized with the Holy Spirit in our lives. It's for every single aspect of, of our lives. And so Jesus is going to send them out, and they need this power. Everywhere they went, they would discover and they would know, they would, they would have that power uh, upon their, uh, uh, their lives to be a witness. Now, how in the world do we uh, uh, get this power? Uh, Jesus addresses that subject too. And you notice that it's received. That's another word that's worth circling uh, in verse eight. Uh, it, you shall receive. And how is it received? It's received simply by asking God for this dynamic to occur in our lives. Now, here in this initial experience of the baptism with the Holy Spirit, it occurred, they were to tarry, they were to wait the 10 days. They didn't know it would be 10 days until the day of Pentecost because the coming of the Holy Spirit would be a fulfillment of the day, great Jewish feast of uh, the, the uh, feast of, of Pentecost. But uh, no longer do we see in the book of Acts, and we'll see it uh, r repeatedly, uh, when people uh, are Christians and they need to be baptized with the Holy Spirit, none of the apostles tell them to tarry or to wait. They pray with them immediately to receive the baptism with the Holy Spirit. And so all we need to do to receive the baptism with the Holy Spirit is to say, just say, God, I see it, I need it, and I ask you, you promised it, I ask you to give me this power uh, in my life. Jesus said, if you, uh, speaking about human parents, if you being evil in comparison to our heavenly father, if you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, and we do, how much more will your heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? And it's just simply received by uh, asking. And that sincere desire uh, to receive this, and then he is going to impart it to us. And then like salvation, it's received by uh, faith. How do I know that I'm uh, saved? Uh, I know that I'm saved because the Bible says that I'm saved. I've mentioned it before, but once in a while, um, you, you know, someone will come up, they will... Uh, they will receive Christ and I'll, I'll pray with them. And then before they leave, I will ask them, um, are you saved? Uh, and they will say, uh, yes. And I say, great. Now, when you go home and you tell somebody that you're saved now and, and forgiven, and they ask you, how in the world do you know that? What are you going to tell them? And I know that they don't know the answer to that question. It makes me feel powerful in these conversations. So I, they, I know that they don't know. So I turn them to John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And so I say, are you a whosoever? Yes, I am. Have you believed in Jesus Christ? Yes, I have. Okay, then you're not going to be perish, but you now have everlasting life based upon an emotional experience? No, based upon the promise of God's word. Many people, when they are born again, it is a deeply emotional experience for them. I mean, outwardly, they weep and they sob and they want to hug everybody within 100 yards of them. And then there's other people of a different kind of temperament. They've been listening, listening to the Word of God, and uh, they've heard it taught. They've been weighing it. They see uh, everything about it. And then they become a Christian as well. And you would uh, hardly know in terms of their emotional response that they've been born again but it's happened in their life. And the same thing is with the Holy Spirit. 
It, it can be different for, for different people, but we know we've received it because we have, uh, it was promised by God, we have asked for it, and so it has become a, a part of, uh, of our lives. Now, what will the baptism of the Holy Spirit uh, look like in our lives? Um, and, and people are curious about that. Well, it will be, it will look like um, it will look like Jesus in our lives. That's what it'll look like. It'll look like the fruit of the Holy Spirit, love, joy, peace, love being preeminent. I will experience a power to love. So we have truth in the scriptures, uh, by virtue of the scriptures, but in order for us to represent Christ in the world, we can't just bring truth to the world. We have to bring love to the world. We have to carry that message with truth. And so I will, there will be a love that's introduced into my life for other people, for the world, for the lost, that never existed before, because that's the heart of Christ. And then, it will, and then the water, this baptism with the Holy Spirit, it will uh, look like Jesus in me. And that's what Jesus is saying. That's what it's for, the power to live a Christ-like life uh, in any environment I find myself in. It also tells us, because people get antsy about the Holy Spirit, because a lot of crazy things are done in the name of the Holy Spirit. I mean, if any of you have ever seen, uh, I remember uh, uh, back when there was that uh, drunk in the spirit thing that was going on, the Toronto Blessing. And this thing is on television every night and people falling down and acting like they're, uh, you know, drunk in the spirit. And doesn't the Bible say, you know, be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be ye filled with the Holy Spirit and these twisting of the scriptures and all of this. And then when you just think it couldn't get any worse, then they started laughing in the Holy Spirit. I, my mom struggled with mental illness. So, we would go and visit her at times when she would be in and out of Napa State Hospital. And you go through door after door, clank, 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 to go see your mom and you're just this little kid. And, and you hear laughing that is incoherent, that is going, uh, going on. It's, it, it's an eerie kind of thing. So people are like laughing and ascribing it uncontrollably to the Holy Spirit. Well, once you start that, that kind of a cycle, and now the gifts of the Holy Spirit and the power of the Holy Spirit are just for the performing of a dog and pony show, uh, to do something weird to bring glory to God, then you always have to top it. And so being drunk in the Spirit goes into laughing in the Spirit, and then it goes to barking in the Spirit, which was the next thing. And then at that point, I just kind of checked out and keeping track of, of this kind of thing. But it's understandable that, that people, because of their background and all, can be hesitant related to the things of the Holy Spirit. But Jesus reassures us that the baptism of the Holy Spirit will never cause us to do anything that doesn't look like Christ. Anything that is inconsistent with his character, inconsistent with what we know about him and see of him in the scriptures. And so anytime you see something that is ascribed to the Holy Spirit and it doesn't look anything like Christ, we can feel absolutely free to say uh, that is not the baptism with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit would not produce that. One of my favorite names for the Holy Spirit in all of the Bible is that he is the Spirit of Christ. That's what he produces within our lives. That's the longing of our life. That's the longing that the Holy Spirit puts into our life. Could I live a life uh, like Jesus that would somehow impact other people, make him known in the way that others did, uh, did for me and did uh, for uh, um, each of us in coming to know the Lord? And so... Uh, sometimes that, uh, so th that is the instruction that Jesus gives related to the baptism with the Holy Spirit. Sometimes, and one of the great questions that people ask about the baptism with the Holy Spirit is that 
um, people say, well, I thought we got all, of, all uh, everything, every dynamic of the Holy Spirit when we were uh, born again. And I, and I understand that. And uh, sometimes people do, and sometimes people don't. Um, and, and so you have, uh, you have a case where um, you can ha- even have a person who attends a church that is even hostile uh, or um, not comfortable with the baptism with the Holy Spirit or the person of the Holy Spirit. And I've experienced this in my life. And you walk up to the entrance of the church and there she is, she's handing out bulletins to greet you. And she has a torrent of living water coming out of her innermost being as Jesus described the baptism with the Holy Spirit in John chapter seven. And she is, she is baptized, she is overflowing with the Holy Spirit in her life. May not be able to answer a single question about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But it's clearly the life of Christ is flowing out of, uh, of her uh, life. But it's interesting as well that a couple times later as we get to them in the book of Acts, and particularly in Acts chapter eight, there's a group of men and women in, in a city that are clearly born again. They've believed in Jesus Christ unto salvation. Peter and John are then sent uh, to that Samaritan city to check out what is going on from Jerusalem, check out what is going on there. They come in among these Christians and they recognize that something, they're still missing something. The Holy Spirit's with them, the Holy Spirit is in them, but they're missing this dynamic. And so they then laid hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit coming upon them, this experience. So there was a a time between the moment of being born again and then the time that they were baptized in the Holy Spirit. You're never gonna put this in a box. You're never gonna get it down to a formula. Uh, It always comes down to the question of, do I sense in my life Uh, the power of the Holy Spirit to be a witness and and does that mark my Christian life? And if it doesn't, uh, then to realize there is a greater dynamic of the Holy Spirit to operate within my life. Now let me clarify one thing before I say one thing after that and then we close. So concerning the baptism with the Holy Spirit, and saying, Lord, baptize me with your Holy Spirit. Give me this power to live for you in every environment and die for you in any environment I find myself in in life. And then uh, uh, that requesting of that from the Lord. And then because we've requested in accordance with his will, we receive it. But Paul wrote uh, to the church at Ephesus and he also said, be being filled or be filled with the Holy Spirit. Uh, And the idea is be being filled with the Holy Spirit. And he's telling Christians that are already spirit filled. In other words, there's one baptism with the Holy Spirit, but many refillings of the Holy Spirit. And here's why that's necessary. So uh, for instance, we'll just use an office environment. You can use a school environment, a home environment, a marriage environment, a raising kids environment. It it works all the way across. But here you have somebody who is a Christian and they work in some kind of a business setting. Uh, and, uh, and here uh, they meet with somebody, it's a, it may be an employee and it's a difficult situation. They meet with them and, and it's really hard. The person is a, a, a Christian that's meeting with this other person and they begin the day with, a holy, with this torrent of living water flowing out of their innermost being, filled with the Holy Spirit, representing Christ and then Uh, this person that has come into their life is kind of like a human sponge. It's demanding that. It's pulling that from them. And And we recognize it. And so before you bring the next appointment in, we say, Lord, would you freshly fill me with your Holy Spirit now for what I'm about to enter into here. So one baptism with the Holy Spirit, many refillings. Sometimes you'll hear me come out and I'll 
open a, a, us up in prayer before we turn to the word and I'll say, Lord, would you freshly fill us with your Holy Spirit uh, to appreciate your word and learn your word here. And somebody can think, what do you mean, you know, freshly, fi is he saying you gotta be born again every time you come to church? No, that's the, that's the difference. Uh, we're talking about this uh, a, a P, talking about this upon experience of the Holy Spirit. Now, freshly fill us. We all come into this room uh, 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 during the week. We've got this weighing on us, that weighing on us, this difficult situation that we've just come out of or we're going into all of this. And just to say, would you freshly fill me with your Holy Spirit now to receive your word in the way that, that I want to. And this, so there's the many refillings that, that go uh, on in our lives and there's nothing wrong with that. I think that, um, and, and it's necessary, I think one of the th things a person can look at uh, firmly and, uh, and determine, uh, no, I, I need to be, uh, I need this experience of the baptism with the Holy Spirit um, is a, a Christian life that is continually defeated. Continually defeated. I feel no power at all. I prayed the sinner's prayer. He's come into my life. He says this, but I get run over by the world, the flesh, and the devil every single day. And that's what the baptism of the Holy Spirit is for. It's the power to not live that kind of a, of a Christian uh, life. So uh, every so often, we, we'll remind those that are up in front praying with people uh, after a service that if you're talking with somebody and, and they come up maybe uh, two, three, four times and their life is just m marked by continual defeat, they love the Lord. They want to live for him. Uh, it, it, they want the fullness of the Christian life, but it's just defeat after defeat after defeat. And to then just ask, have you ever been baptized with the Holy Spirit? Do you know what that is? Let's pray for that right now in your life so that that dynamic of the Christian life, that supernatural dynamic, not only the instruction of God's word in terms of what to live, but the power of the Holy Spirit to live what we read about um, in the scriptures. I think the second thing that uh, uh, makes us look at it and say, no, I, I, uh, I, I don't know when this happens or that happens in anybody's life and all of that. The Bible is uh, it, it determined um, not to become a formula on, on, on th this issue is when a Christian finds themselves in a Romans chapter seven uh, Christian experience. And let me, let me just read it to you and see if any of you recognize something like uh, this at, at some time in your life. Paul wrote and he said, for I know that in me that is my flesh, nothing good dwells. For to will is present uh, in me, I want to live for God. But how, and that's the word, but how to perform what is good I do not find. For the good that I want to do, I don't do. The evil that I don't want to do, that I practice. Now if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. I find a law that, is, that evil is present with me, the one who wills to do good, for I delight in the law of God according to the inward man, but I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into the captivity of the law of sin, which is my members. And he's got this, this battle going on. He's trying to live the Christian life in his own strength. And, and it cannot be done. If Jesus told the apostles, do not move from this city until you have experienced the baptism with the Holy Spirit, then how can a single one of us as Christians believe that somehow we can live it independent of the Holy Spirit? And to try and live the Christian life in the power of my own strength, that God has given me his commandments in the scripture, now I'm going to do it in my own strength, 
All it is ever going to lead to is a Christian life that is marked by defeat and by just immense frustration over the continual uh, defeat. And that's the frustration that Paul writes from in Romans chapter seven. And then he caps it off and he says, "'O wretched man that I am, who, He realizes now that uh, the ability to live this life has to come from outside of him. He says, who will deliver me from this body of death? And then the book of Romans closes. No, that's not what happens. (laughs) He goes on and he says, I thank God through Jesus Christ, uh, our Lord. And then you go on into chapter eight of the book of Romans, and it is full of instruction on the person and the work of the Holy Spirit. And my heart always goes out for where there can be a neglect related to the fullness of the Holy Spirit and a neglect or even a a looking down on even the idea of the baptism with the Holy Spirit. I don't think that there can be a worse experience in life than putting my faith in Jesus Christ, being born again, and then trying to live this life, unable to do it, and then conclude Christianity doesn't work for me. All because I've never been told about the baptism with the Holy Spirit or experienced the baptism with the Holy Spirit. And I think about how many people have tried and tried and tried Christianity represented as God giving us the commandments. Now you keep it in your own strength, discovering they have no ability to do that and then walking away and saying, I tried it, it didn't work for me. And the baptism of the Holy Spirit is what allows it to work for everyone. And so this evening, if you've never been baptized with the Holy Spirit, you say, my life is one of continual defeat, my life is one of continual uh, frustration, or I've never even heard of such a thing. God loves us so much. He doesn't going to take and dangle something in front of us and say, oh, would you give that to me? (laughs) I've known people to do that with people, their kids even. And uh, uh, God isn't into that kind of cruelty. He will give it to us. We're baptized with the Holy Spirit. And then we spend our lives continually. It is a daily part of my life. Lord, would you freshly fill me now with your Holy Spirit so that people can come into contact with you rather than the old me when they come into contact with me. And and he will provide that uh, to our lives. And it's all there for the asking, all there for the receiving. If you've never received that baptism with the Holy Spirit, there's going to be pastors and other men and women up in front immediately after the service, and they would love to pray with you uh, to uh, receive that. If you're here tonight and you are not born again yet, you've never trusted in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your, holy, uh, of your sins, the Holy Spirit ha- has not come into your life yet, that's where you start. And we'd love to answer your questions and pray with you up in front afterwards as well. And uh, anything, any need that you might have in your life, we'd be happy to pray with you about that tonight. And so let's stand together and um, let's pray. I'm not a big person for um, having people um, stand or make a public display necessarily about an issue like this or about sin or about anything. I just really believe in these things occurring within the the privacy of our own own heart. I'm not down on that, but I don't, I don't try to manufacture that to make something happen so I can feel good about it or we can feel like the Holy Spirit moved. But I do want to give you an opportunity to ask for this tonight if you've never received it before. And so let's pray. Father, I ask that now as we stand before you and we've been here talking about the single biggest thing on Jesus' heart before he ascended 
back into the glory of heaven. And I ask that you would confirm your word with accompanying signs and wonders in every person's life tonight who knows you and loves you and longs to have the power to live a life that represents that love to you and then represents you before the world. And if you stand here tonight, before you head out and grab kids or you start to fellowship with one another and get distracted, if you are in that place tonight and you want to be baptized with the Holy Spirit, just tell him that right now where you are. He knows you, he loves you, he's inside of you, and he will meet you right where you are and he will bless you with this dynamic of the baptism with the Holy Spirit. I want you to have a reference point in which you have asked for that and for you to now move forward in faith from that experience. And so just ask him, we're just gonna be quiet for uh, a few seconds. I'm not gonna lead you in a prayer because you don't need me to do that. He reads the prayer in your heart. You just say, that's me, Lord. Would you bring that into my life? And just communicate that to him right now. Father, thank you for this Christian life in which you provide us with the will to do and then the power to do of your good pleasure, the desire to obey you, the desire to live the Christian life, and then the empowering to be able to do that. You have thought of everything, and we are grateful. Thank you, Lord, for the time that we've had to talk about and to learn about this important subject tonight. Continue, we pray, the blessing of your scriptures upon our hearts as we leave this place concerning the ministry of your Holy Spirit and specifically the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And we ask this in Jesus' name, amen.